Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. This is your first time tuning into the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and, and Apple Podcasts. And if you are joining us on ESPN Radio, thank you all so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Dan Wolkenstein, lots to get into as the Chargers have wrapped up mandatory minicamp this week. And their final practice before they go to El Segundo to christen the new facility, the Bolt, down in El Segundo. Crazy. Lots to get into. Lots of comments at the podium that we want to get into, dissect, give our opinions on. Uh, it was a big week for the Chargers for everything that they were doing. Very busy week, considering where they were practicing, uh, things that they had to get through, and a lot of observations to take in. Before we get into it, Dan Wolkenstein, how are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Energized from this week of Chargers news, storylines, uh, all the people at the podium, you mentioned it. Today, we'll go through all of the podiums, Derwin James, Justin Herbert, some of the coaching staff. You had Jesse Minter, Greg Roman discuss some things. Also had Khalil Mack and, Khal- and Joey Bosa, excuse me, on the mic. A lot of takeaways. There's a lot happening this week. This is a very important week for the Chargers team before they head out for five, six weeks, and then it's full tilt training camp. A lot here. Super fun. If you have not done so already, please hit that like and subscribe, as well as go check out the crossover episode we did yesterday with the one and only Locked On Chargers fellas. That was a lot of fun. A ton of fun. An hour and a half. It was absolute mayhem, but it was lovely. Uh, Jake, how are you? I'm doing fine, sir. Doing fine. Looking forward to the weekend. We're almost there. It is Friday. Well, tell you, yeah, it's when we're recording this. It's Friday Eve, but to all of you out there, happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Jake, let's get to it. Before we do that, play the Bills. Talk about our friends. I want to remind everybody that Bet Online remains your number one source for all your summer sports this season for baseball, golf, NBA, and NHL playoff stats. All the latest stats, news, scores, and available to follow for all of your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport that's out there. Head on over to the website today. That's betonline.ag. Use the promo code UNLEASHED. Or use your mobile device to get into the action. Once again, that's betonline.ag. Remember to use the promo code UNLEASHED. Let them know that Chargers Unleashed sent you. Bet Online where the game starts. So we said it. Lots to unpack here. We're going to try to go rapid fire here and cram as much as we can in here for you viewers and listeners uh, who haven't a chance to go through and kind of sift through all this stuff. And some takeaways that we had, Jake, let's start with minicamp observations. And what we saw this week, I think to me, was very important for one key position group. And for me, like maybe two. Offensive line, we started to see things kind Absolutely. of get... Uh, ironed out a bit in terms of the starting five, as well as some of the cornerback secondary group uh, starting to kind of develop and showcase their abilities and take that next step. Mainly Tar Heap still, Cam Hart. We know Derwin James, Lohi Gilman, those two are pretty set. Jim Harbaugh had lots of praise for them. But the secondary, big storyline we've talked about. Offensive line, big story. Both of those look to be improving, but the offensive line, we all kind of saw it coming, writing on the wall. It's just a matter of formalities, but it appears starting five is set. Yeah, the the first two days of minicamp was kind of a tale of two sides of the ball because the first day of minicamp, it seemed like the defense won the day. They had a number of uh, defensive red zone stops. And then the next day, Justin Herbert comes out and throws five touchdowns in practice. But still a lot of competition going on, namely, as you mentioned, Dan, with the cornerback position and more specifically Tarheep Still. There was obviously with the offensive line combination that Jim Harbaugh came out later early, earlier this week and in a soft way kind of said that the offensive combination of Rashawn Slater, Zion Johnson, Bradley Bozeman, Trey Pipkins, and Joe Alt is your starting five heading into this year. But you look at some of the observations that was done again here's Jim Harbaugh out there with the tarps getting that those anticipation drills with the wide receivers and Justin Herbert going again Lad McConkey is just once again having another fantastic week even in even in uh, mini camps even in June who cares what it looks like because Justin Herbert talked about him today and said that he looks like he's been about a four or five year vet with the way that he has been carrying himself out there and the rest of the position groups that are going to have a lot of competition here in the next six weeks. So it's uh, it was business as usual, obviously, for Justin Herbert, namely some of those big-time takeaways, throwing even to targets that you wouldn't even necessarily think of as it relates to some undrafted rookie tight ends. Simi Fajoko caught a long touchdown pass from Justin Herbert early on in the week. So it's building this rapport. It's breeding competition, which Jim Harbaugh loves to do. So 
the early days of minicamp seem to be a rousing success all around. Yeah, Josh Palmer is going to touchdown. Isaiah Spiller is going to touchdown. St. Fajoko scoring. You got tight end scoring. Uh, going around the block, and Lad McConkey is slaying. Uh, Justin Herbert we'll talk about later, but Justin Herbert kind of saw him as someone who picked things up so quick and already sees him as like a four or five year veteran, which music to our ears as Chargers fans and folks covering this team. They need that with some of the presence that's no longer there. Uh, the secondary group, huge. That's a really big deal. Tarheep still, Jesse Mitchell talked about that. We'll get into it later, but him showing uh, much improved performance and kind of took that next step forward this week and starting to put things together. Overall, though, I think the headline has to be that the offensive line is set. And um, you, we heard kind of themes throughout most of the coaching staff. The big variable, I think, to everybody is the one at right guard. And everybody has praised Trey Pipkins, not just as a right guard, but his work ethic, his performance, his capabilities, and just how he's kind of attacked things, his leadership. You hear from some of the coaching staff. And Greg Roman is very bullish on Trey Pipkins at guard. Everything is on the pretense of we'll see with pads on, but there's no reason to believe that he's not going to be the guard uh, and a very, very good one, uh, according to the staff. Um, those are kind of the main takeaways on the field, so to speak. I think the rest of the takeaways, if I'm not mistaken, most of the big ones came from the microphone, from the podiums in Camp Pendleton, and then obviously the last couple of days uh, up there in Costa Mesa. And we'll get to a lot of those. So I think what we'll want to do, Jake, let's start with coaching staff at the podium, and then we'll get to the players. So let's start off with, Today, again, all of these we're lumping together. The last few days, we're going to lump together, try to cram as much as we can. So we'll start off with Jesse Minter, Greg Roman. We're at the podium, and there were a lot of tidbits and a lot of things that were discussed by both of them. A couple ones that stand out to me, Jake. One is Jesse Minter when discussing Derwin James, right? We've all heard Jesse Minter talk about, and everybody kind of talk about Derwin James being an incredible athlete and talked about him being in a position where they want him to be most effective. That doesn't mean doing everything all at once. And it's all about putting him in the best position in a game and situational basis. And I love this. He had told Derwin James, let's restate the claim of you being one of the best safeties in football, which obviously Derwin James took that and ran with it. Talked about how happy he is for the team, especially himself and for junior Colson being on the team and the special relationship they have. And one part that was interesting was I gleaned from him. He was talking about Bud Dupree. And I don't know if many people caught this, but you know, it being a violent game, and it's important that they have these guys rotate in and be fresh. And the goal is to have four, or hopefully five, he says. I think there are four, hopefully five, however the roster shakes out, quote unquote. But there are certainly four that are proven commodities in this league says Jesse Minter. Four or five, hopefully. I take that, Jake, as we talked about the hot seats. We know the four. That fifth one might not even be on the roster. And if it is on the roster, who is it? Exactly. (laughs) My favorite takeaway from the Minter comments, Dan, was, again, you harken back to Derwin James where he says, I'm going to try over the summer to clone him and make three of them you know, jokingly saying that about Derwin James, but he was just lauding how quickly Derwin has been motivated to pick up this defense, how quickly he's been doing it. Just the leader that he's obviously been for this defense for a number of years now. Um, it seems like you, it, 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 if you're looking at it from an outside perspective, it still feels like to me that we're trying to chase the 2018 version of Derwin James in terms of how he was yes, deployed in that defense. I think it's exactly what Jesse Minter wants to do. And not to say that previous defensive coordinators and Brandon Staley and among others didn't try to do that, but they just were unsuccessful in doing so. And that was for Mm -hmm. a number of different factors, whether it was injuries to Derwin himself, injuries to other people in the secondary, whatever the scheme may have been. But Jim Harbaugh, Jesse Minter know exactly the type of player and the exact type leader that Derwin James is. And they know how valuable he is to this team to make this defense work. 
Yep. And the one other one for me with Jesse Minter before we get to Greg Roman was you've talked about it at length. We've heard a lot of people, especially on defense, talk about the importance of versatility, especially in the secondary. And Jesse Minter harped on that again. And the ability to have these players, excuse me, the players have the ability to learn different coverages, learn different positions, so they can not necessarily be positionless, but understand and be able to play certain positions that may not be their strong suit or what they're normally used to playing. But what I found interesting, this almost sounded like a sales pitch without being a sales pitch was he was starting to talk about the players sensing that there's a lot of opportunity for snaps because of Derwin's flexibility. So we think Derwin's flexibility, you think of him being in the box, right? Which means there's a lot of snaps to be had by the rest of the secondary, not named Alohi Gilman. So cornerbacks have a lot of opportunity here. That's not just cornerbacks that are on the field in pads for the Chargers right now, or I guess in pads in the future, but do they bring in another one? That's, I mean, think about it as a free agent corner right now. You have opportunities for snaps on this team because Derwin James is going to be all over the place. So Cam Hart, Tarheem Still, Asante Samuel Jr., Christian Fulton, Jazir Taylor, Dean Leonard was talked about by him a little bit. These guys know that there's going to be opportunities for them and they have to step up or someone else will or someone else will be brought in. And so that was exciting to me because earlier on we heard one of the coaching staff, I forget who it was, was saying they have a starting 13 on defense. We all know there's 11 players who start, but that speaks to them rotating players in. Who will the 12th and 13th player be? That's the interesting part. We know they're going to rotate on the edge group. I get it. It's going to be in the secondary too. Yeah, just again, Mentor, you kind of all paraphrased it there, Dan, but just again, talking about the versatility but probably was the biggest aspect of Mentor. Again, chasing what makes Derwin James such a great safety and talking about everything that he does well. But we've talked about it and we've heard from other people about it. As much as Derwin James can do, you don't want to overload him and put too much responsibility because we've seen that and we've seen how that doesn't work, even from a caliber of player like Derwin James. So you're going to simplify it. You're going to put Derwin James in the best position on defense where he can win at multiple d- positions. And in turn, you're going to make this defense better because he is just such a key chess piece of that. So I'm really excited to see how they end up deploying this by the time that we get to September. Yeah. And then I know a lot of people talked about uh, the hesitancy of bringing in someone like a Greg Roman with historical ties to a dominant run game, but maybe they question how much they would bring to the passing game. I don't think there are many more pe- people thinking that anymore, especially after some of the things that we have heard from not just him, but most of the coaching staff and players. And Greg Roman has harped on this multiple times, but he, as well as Jim Harbaugh, are gung-ho intent on this being a balanced offense, creating options for themselves both through the ground and through the air. And he had mentioned in this press conference today that you know he's not just going to run against a brick wall if it's not working. And what I thought was fascinating, and I loved this quote, and sometimes as Chargers fans, you've been on the receiving side of this. But his quote was, when he was asked about kind of the running game, is sometimes, this is a quote, Sometimes the illusion of wanting to run the ball a lot is just as powerful as the ability to. When I hear that, if a defense knows that you can run effectively and you have done it effectively, a defense will tend to either compensate or oftentimes overcompensate to ensure that you can't do it, leaving them vulnerable to other plays that are not running plays. And so... For me, it is imperative, it is paramount that this Chargers team can show that they can run the ball effectively because once that happens, then Justin Herbert will cook. No doubt about it. But before you can give the illusion, you got to put it on film for people to see that you can actually do it. 
Yeah, the other piece to that, Dan, is, and this is something that you and I have had conversations about when just talking about Greg Roman or even talking about the running backs in general, is that this entire running back room has been completely revamped to a style where it's not going to be just one guy who's going to be the bell cow anymore. You bring in Gus Edwards, you bring in J.K. Dobbins, you go out and you draft Kamani Vidal, you still have Isaiah Spiller, who from a scheme standpoint should fit very, very well in this run scheme. And Greg Roman alluded to it in his press conference where he basically said, you know, we're going to give you different looks every time we run the ball. It's not just going to be the same guy. It's going to be a running back by committee with his team. And I love that idea because this is talking about keeping guys fresh. This is talking about giving other guys opportunity. And each one of these guys really brings a different flavor and a different style to how they run the ball. And I think that that was exactly what Jim Harbaugh, Greg Roman, and Joe Hortiz were thinking when they were creating this stable. And when you can be that versatile in one position group, it's just one position group of this offense. And how you're going to now plan to unload each and every one of them and give them all meaningful touches, that's going to give the defense a lot to think about. And I'm glad he brought that up because I forgot to mention with Jesse Minter, one of the things that was interesting when talking about Bud Dupree was because this is a violent game, you want these guys fresh, right? And they have four or five guys they can be able to cycle through. And four of them are at least at least four are proven commodities. But he harped on, like you just mentioned with the running backs, on the money downs in the league, the money areas of the field, as the field shrinks, he likes the ability of having a chance to have his guys fresh and be able to really cut it loose, help them get off the field in critical situations and being at their best and maybe more fresh than they maybe have been in the past in the third and fourth quarter to close games out. And you talk about the running backs. You talk about the offensive line. Because they're probably going to be cycling things through maybe a sixth offensive line at time, offensive lineman at times. Same with the secondary, same with the defensive line. That's what depth does. Like it's both a luxury and a necessity for any successful team. And that's what they're going for. It's not just about the top end of this roster that wins championships or any roster that wins championships. Depth wins or loses games every week in football. And so I'm with you. I, I think that was huge and will be huge for this team. I think it's also pretty clear that this coaching staff, top to bottom, loves Justin Herbert. I mean, everybody does. We all knew that. But, you know, it, there's a couple of quotes here that Greg Roman had about him that I thought was just indicative and exemplary, exemplary of what this team believes and thinks about Justin Herbert. This is a quote. I would just say the level of his ability to think real quickly, his ability to almost memorize a game plan to a T, it's impressive. We all knew that coming in that Justin is a super talented guy, but then when you see it, how he works day in and day out diligently, he takes everything very seriously. He just empowers everyone around him. Second part, to be in, to be in June right now and have him where he is with us and what we're doing speaks volumes. We've thrown a lot at him, too. We kind of, a couple of times, going the extra mile, try to overload him, try to overload him. It just wasn't happening. He wasn't having any overload. He can shoulder the load. That's why you have a franchise quarterback. And Chill's just reading it. That's why you pay this man. That's why people came to Los Angeles. That's why Jim Harbaugh is here, is because of a quarterback with his potential, with his abilities. It is clear. And David and Dan, we talked about this yesterday on the crossover. It is such a stain on this franchise that they have not been to the fr- to the playoffs more than once in four years with Justin Herbert. It's not because of Justin. We know we all know that, and he's gotten so much flack because of it, because of the lack of playoff success. You just are hoping that this team can take advantage of what they have at quarterback, and because Greg Rowan knows what they have at quarterback, as does the rest of the staff. 100%. I couldn't set it any better, Dan, honestly. the I, I, I think everybody's just betting just to say, like, it's it's going to be a guarantee that the Chargers are going to make the playoffs. You know, that's the goal of what Jim Harbaugh is going to do. That's why you went out and you got him. I think from the standpoint of what has now taken place in the months since Jim Harbaugh has been here, this is where you're really seeing this brain trust just really come together on the same message. Everybody knows what it is that they want to do from an offensive standpoint, from the defensive standpoint, and the players are buying into it emphatically in a way that we have never seen 
from some of these guys before. Yeah, attention to detail. We've heard that one to 50 times in the last set couple of months, but even in the last couple of days, we've seen people talk about that, which we'll get to with Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, as well as with Jim Harbaugh. Uh, the last piece on Greg Roman before we get over to the players is he point he noted about Trey Pipkins, called him a shining star so far this offseason. Uh, mentioned how great he's been in there at guard. He has really good football IQ, obviously big presence. Uh, physically, and he's pretty bullish on him. And then the other part of that is the wide receiver room. Conveniently, they have not made like a depth chart for the receivers. I don't know if that's receivers yet or just receivers in general, but there is no depth chart for the wide receiver room. Um, anything else on the offense of a defensive coordinator before we get to the players? Let's get to the players. Okay. So this is where, uh, actually, Jim Harbaugh. You haven't talked about Jim Harbaugh yet. Jim Harbaugh was at the podium a couple days ago, as well as today. And the the theme of Jim Harbaugh, and it's funny because, I mean, first off, we all love listening to Jim Harbaugh. Like, it's so fun just hearing him talk, regardless of what he's talking about. I think he just kind of reminds you of just like one of the guys, right? He's clearly brilliant football mind. We all know that. But the way that he leads and the way that he communicates, it's very easy to buy in. It's very easy to engage with him, right? For those of you tuning on ESPN Radio, be sure to check the full episode uh, on YouTube, anywhere you find your podcast. Jim Harbaugh, like everyone else, gushes over Justin Herbert. We all know that. Talks about how he practices, his physical and mental traits, his work ethic. He's a smart, quick learner, his conditioning, yada, 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 yada. Justin Herbert is a god, essentially. And apparently, I think he said he would trade any gene of his for Justin Herbert's. Uh, he was bullish on the offensive line, thinks that they are on track to be a top-tier offensive line in the NFL. And right now, Trey Pipkins is part of that group, presumably, at right guard. Um, I think right, you think about some of the players who are out due to injury. You think about Gus Edwards or Donald Parham Jr., Junior Colson, who was out there for a little bit. Uh, the goal of this team was to be healthy, healthiest at training camp. And they're heading to that direction. They're getting there. Um, But make no mistake about it. He knows how good his staff is. And he harped on the impact the coaching staff has made on the players, both their technique and offense, defense uh, in the, in the locker room, in the film room and on the field. Um, The other part, I was going to say, to put that final stamp of approval from Derwin James, again, Harbaugh, basically. (laughs) So, If you want to know the type of leader that Jim Harbaugh thinks Derwin James is, he's obviously he's praising Derwin James' work ethic, but in general, he's basically saying to any other player, what's number three doing? He was asked, like, if somebody's wearing a a sweatshirt, he's like, hey, coach, can I wear a sweatshirt to practice? Is Derwin doing it? Okay, good. He's doing it. You can do it. Fine. (laughs) So it's just like everything is being related through your two leaders on the offense and defensive side of the ball. Jim Harbaugh knows exactly where the leadership stands. Yes. Uh, Jake, the other part that I thought was interesting from Harbaugh before we get to the players, he was very bullish on the defensive line, called out Denzel Perriman specifically, uh, was bullish on the edge group, was bullish on interior defensive line, but bullish on the interior defensive line and noted he didn't know what the defense was going to be when he got here, but he now believes the defensive line, including the interior, is a strength of this team. We've talked about the interior defensive line being kind of a question mark. Are you buying what they're selling for the interior? Or do you think that there might be something else there to be had? Look, I'm not I'm not trying to poo-poo the personnel, but Jim Harbaugh essentially, I think, had something to do with the meteoric rise of J.J. McCarthy in the draft process when he was basically saying that he believed that J.J. was the best quarterback in the league. And then all the mock drafts were saying, oh, he's going to be the third one off the board. Hell, the Chargers may even take him at number five. This is just about getting your guys to believe. And again, yes, from an outside perspective, when we look at this roster, there's a lot of question marks that are there. But this is the power that a good coach and immortal uh, motivator like Jim Harbaugh can do. So he has every belief in the interior defensive line. 
we're going to witness it and we're going to see what it's all about. Yep. He, he noticed uh, some of the updates on the injury, which I found fascinating. Uh, he was very intent and very purposeful in not sharing anything about injuries. He kind of noted like HIPAA compliance and not want to overshare, but the quote going through something was something that we heard about Donald Parham Jr. I said that about Junior Colson at the time. And it appears that's probably the same case for Gus Edwards, for Will Disley. But all of them are trending in the right direction. All of them have a very high chance of being all available for training camp. Um, the other part that I found interesting from him today, before we get to the players, Jake, is attention to detail. We talked about this. We'll get to it with the players. But there was a quote that Jim Harbaugh had kind of emphasizing attention to detail. And he was kind of bringing it back to the word discipline comes from disciple being a good follower. I think that's where it starts. For me, it was my dad, just the way that he trained me from being a little kid. Hey, Jim, whoever the expert is, that person knows the subject matter better than you do. Whether that's a coach, a teacher at school, a professor, whatever it is, a doctor especially, that person knows the subject better than you do. If you listen to that person and you do what they tell you to do, then you'll be successful. That's just ingrained like the DNA that's carried over, whether it's football or anything else, that's the way I learned to do it. That, to me, is such a glaring difference of this staff than what I've seen in all of the years that I've covered and seen this team since. And I didn't really know the staff really back in the LT days or the 94 era, right? But humility. He doesn't have to be the smartest guy in the room. He doesn't want to be the smartest guy in the room. He will lean on his staff to get the most out of them for the betterment of the team. He listens to the experts, let them do the things that they do best, rely on them to carry you. And that's huge. That's the brain trust that we talked about that I'm so grateful that this team finally has. Dan, it's a resounding message that we've seen carried from the assistant head coaches, even not necessarily in that same, you know, verbiage of Jim Harbaugh talking about it, but it's like, go to Steve Klinkscale when he's talking about, I want all the guys on in my secondary to learn both how to play the inside and the outside. You heard Jesse Minter talk about how versatile he wants his defense to be. He knows its strengths that he wants to put his guys in the best possible position to where they're not going to be out of position or they're going to be in a position where they're going to fail. This is all a huge just notation of communication between coach and player and learning from one another. And like you mentioned, it is something that this team has lacked for years and years and years. Never have we heard anything like this to this level, nor have we heard the players buying into this message this quickly in the game. We have talked plenty of times about how we felt like there was distension in the locker room, that the message wasn't being heard. Guys just were constantly on a week-to-week basis just not getting it. The coaching staff was not able to get through to them. Damn, we're not even to week one. We're not even into training camp right now. And these are the, this is the message that's being sent right off the bat, and you're hearing guys buy into it immediately. Yeah, let's talk about those guys. Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack were at the podium, at the podium uh, yesterday, and then Justin Herbert, Derwin James at the podium today, so Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, let's start with Mac and Bosa. Jake, what were your takeaways other than the fact that attention to details matter and this group of players is so ready and it p- appears to have a chip on its shoulder and uh, ready to cook? Yeah, between the two of them, there were definitely quotes about attention to detail, certain coaching perspectives that it's not hard to connect the dots what they were talking about between one <laughs> Of one organization and one coaching scheme to the one that's currently in place right now. But yeah, Dan, the fact of the attention to detail, I think one of the biggest things that I took away from it was the, was some of the quotes from Joey Bosa. Yes. Because let's remember, both Cleo Mack and Joey Bosa restructured their contracts to stay with this team. I don't think I've ever heard Bosa sound like this before. Me neither. I was going to mention this. Me neither. Because he was saying, he was talking about Khalil Mack, and he said, if a guy like Khalil coming off of 17 sacks can take a cut like that, it shows the kind of guy that he is and the culture that we have brewing here. That's who I want to be with. It was a pretty easy decision. Both of them went on to talk about 
their desire to win, wanting to be on this team and wanting to win with them. Khalil Mack was talking about, I want another shot with these guys in this room. Bosa was saying, winning football games is more important to me right now than making some extra money. And of course, both of them talked about, yeah, the fact that Jim Harbaugh was brought on to be the head coach had a little bit something to do with it. (laughs) Yeah, you haven't heard Joey Bosa talk about that stuff before. That quote, winning football games is more important to me right now than making some extra money. I think we have a great opportunity here. Like, he, he continued, who knows? Maybe I'll have a great year this year and things can change down the road. But like you said, then he goes into the Khalil Mack, kind of him, if he if he can do it, I can do it. And yeah, uh, it's incredible to hear two veterans like them see this team as the opportunity and the best opportunity to win. Um, real quick, Joey Bosa talks about like his appreciation to the attention de- to detail that the staff has. Um, you know, it's he talks about like you can pretend that leaving your shoes a mess in your locker room is a mess is isn't a big deal, and what matters is playing football. But I think all of those tiny details and things kind of add up and leak into the important stuff, like what you're doing on the field. If you can have your toe behind the line or have your locker in order and all these things, they kind of stack up into performing well and playing well when things count. I appreciate that. It also hasn't been a fight with the guys in the locker room. They buy in. It's a lot of young guys, and they're hungry to learn, hungry to compete, and hungry to win. Also, I don't know if people heard knew about a lot of this stuff, but Joey Bosa was going through it last year in terms of injury. He talked about a hand, finger, hamstring, foot, toe, all these things that went wrong last year. And he said that it feels great to feel better going into year nine than he has the last four or five years. And this was the quote that I thought was fun. For him. I'm just happy for him, honestly. It's fun feeling really confident in your body and being able to perform and to be able to go out and practice and go balls to the wall. So, Joey Bosa, healthy. Khalil Mack, healthy. Check, check. I think you got to touch a little bit on Ben Herbert's responsibility there because, obviously, he's going to be the man that's going to be responsible for keeping these guys healthy. But in terms of attention to detail, Khalil Mack had some things to say about Ben Herbert just talking about him being an absolute savage in the (laughs) weight room. But I like how he said, when I first approached him, I I said, I'm not scared of you. And Ben Herbert kind of just like leaned back with a smirk on his face as if it was a challenge to say like, okay, let's see what you got. Let's see what you got. Yep. Yeah. So so that edge group is nasty. If that group can stay healthy, this team is going to be a problem. I argue they have the top, the best three and four in the NFL at the edge group. Last one, Jake Herbert, the leader himself spoke in front of the team, actually. And Durbin James, what were some of your key takeaways from those two? The big message, I think, between both Herbert and Derwin James was talking about Jim Harbaugh. Derwin just talking about he has never had a coach with that brings the, the kind of leadership that Jim Harbaugh brings. He says he's never had a coach like that in his entire life. And... You see that, you hear that with the communication between the two of them, and you see how excited Derwin is just to even come to OTAs and mandatory mini camps to get back to work and get this thing going. This is all stemming from Jim Harbaugh. The excitement from player to coach in terms of saying from a leader and a veteran like Derwin James to say, I'm ready to play for you. What do you want me to do because I'm in? That's the mark of a leader. And that's the reason why we keep talking about Jim Harbaugh at nauseum to say he succeeded every single place that he's been. It's not just a coincidence. There is a message that's being sent through that locker room that gets these guys to buy in. And Derwin James and Justin Herbert are no different. No, they're not. They are fully bought in. And, uh, you know, Derwin James, I think, did his best to kind of not throw previous regime under the bus. And they, you know, they mentioned that the previous coaching staff was good, too. Things just didn't work out. But it's clearly different. He said it feels like Christmas with this new staff in this offseason, which I I raised my eyebrows a bit there. Uh, Derwin James called out fellow corner Tarheep Still and Cam Hart specifically 
That's two of the younger secondary players that have impressed him. Um, I think the other interesting nugget here was Derwin James. Y'all heard about kind of that safety three position battle. We saw Tony Jefferson is there for tryouts during minicamp. Talked about Derwin James did. He spoke to Tony Jefferson about his previous time in Baltimore and, the, and his defensive scheme back then. And James also said he hopes Jefferson ends up being signed. In my opinion, Jake, if Derwin James wants Tony Jefferson signed, I'm pretty confident Derwin James is going to see Jefferson signed. Am I wrong? I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> Even on Tony Jefferson's side, are you coming out of retirement? And the only team that we have heard you even being interested in was the Chargers bringing you in on a tryout basis over these last three days. I definitely think that there's some interest there. And yeah, to put the cherry on top of it, if Derwin is calling for it, may want to listen. Yep. Uh, The part that I love about Derwin, though, is he will take responsibility. And as much as so many people are talking about, you know, the struggles of the coaching staff and all the things that went wrong over the last couple of years. Derwin James acknowledged that it is about the players. And he had said that Jim Harbaugh and the new staff, like they've done a great job, but it is up to the players to go out and execute the place. And that's a mark of a leader there. He doesn't throw anybody under the bus. There's no scapegoats. Like he knows it's on them. And so it's a team game. That's why coaching matters. That's why players matter. That's why these guys get paid. That's why coaches get paid, especially good coaches. That's why they get paid. Uh, then Justin Herbert. And it, Justin, I think, is being challenged this year by Jim Harbaugh in a lot of ways. But the one way that I think he's being challenged is he's kind of being forced to acknowledge and take on that leadership role full on. Like, it's not just I'm the quarterback and I can lead from behind and I don't talk much. He's kind of putting him out there, he being Jim Harbaugh, putting Justin Herbert out there to be the leader vocally, visually. I mean, hell, he's wearing the green or the the gold jersey, right? Which I think there was a loophole there, I believe, where he other quarterbacks weren't needing to wear the gold jersey, whatever. Uh, Justin Herbert doesn't like the attention. We all know that, but Jim Harbaugh is kind of making him be comfortable in those uncomfortable situations. Justin Herbert isn't the guy who's going to be raw, raw talk in front of the team. Jim Harbaugh made Justin Herbert talk in front of the team today. And he talked about his praise of the team for, you know, stacking bricks and getting better every day and the commitment to being there and how important this next phase is before training camp. And, I, you're kind of seeing this blossoming arc of Justin Herbert personality as a leader of this team and not just letting his play speak for itself, but letting him speak and kind of forcing him to be that guy. I love that. I'm curious to see how that kind of blooms and moves forward. But before we get to anything else, what are your thoughts on kind of this new Justin Herbert that's having to speak more and, and lead by not just example, but with his words and actions too. I think you feel like you've seen flashes of that Justin Herbert come out over the past couple of years, just in like little nuances, like, you know, the one game where they had the win and Brandon Staley was saying to the team, like, okay, let's break it down. And everybody has tomorrow off. And Justin Herbert looks like, look, no, we're coming in. We're coming into work. You've seen like little flashes of that. Now it seems like it's being taken to another level to where the autonomy is there for Justin to kind of break out of his shell, be more vocal, take that next step that he needs to, not just as a quarterback, but as a leader, to have the entirety of the offense believe in the same thing and believe that this is the guy who is going to take you where you need to be. Jim Harbaugh has understood that before he got to the Chargers as it relates to Justin Herbert. Now it's all about putting that confidence in Justin Herbert and knowing that he can do it himself. Yep. Uh, tying the tying a bow on this one, uh, ju- a one Justin Herbert talked about, I mentioned Lad McConkey talked about his abilities and noted he's a four to five year veteran. It seems at times uh, he noted the amount of success that this coaching staff has had over the years and how helpful it is to have them to learn from and to lean on Jake. You and I have talked about that brain trust and how important that is. You're seeing it pay dividends here. 
He talked about the running back room, Jake. Talked about how fun it is to hand the ball off to them. You could feel the juice, he said. And that's going to be awesome to see, he believes. Uh, I thought this was interesting. This is so Justin Herbert quote, but he was asked about like what he's going to do with the receivers and pass catchers while they're gone from training camp or the facility. And he noted that he and the receivers are going to find a park or a parking lot. doesn't matter to continue to work together ahead of training camp. And uh, there's a lot of other things. Uh, I think the main takeaways for what's important for this team this year, uh, I think we kind of cut, touched on them all. The other one, I think a lot of people, and his mentality is just different. And I think perspective is really important, especially when you go through tough times. And people have talked about how hard and how you know damning it's been and how challenging it is to go through all the different coaching changes that he has, not just in the NFL, but also in college as well. And, and Justin, Justin being Justin, he just on learning new offense again, he just said, it's a good opportunity to learn more football. And he then proceeded to go off on being able to learn all the different languages and words used across the NFL and different schemes. And the opportunity has to learn all these different perspectives and different terminologies. And it's just like, you're, reminded of how awesome this quarterback is both on and off the field. And uh, you mentioned it. Jim Harbaugh talked about do whatever Justin and Derwin do. This is why, because they lead by example and their work ethic, their results on and off the field, how they present themselves, how they hold themselves accountable. That's what makes this team tick. Um, Anything else? Yeah. You talked about the installation there as it relates to the schemes, you know, what have we said over the past couple of years for Justin Herbert? You'd 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 like to see him have a good defense that can hold a lead, or you'd like to see a game where Justin Herbert doesn't necessarily have to play Superman to come back and win a game. And in those certain circumstances, Justin Herbert throwing the ball was the best opportunity that the Chargers had to win any games last year. And then he's talking about this new scheme today. And again, I think this is going to go exactly how the vision of Jim Harbaugh wanted it, how Greg Roman wanted it. And ultimately it's going to benefit Justin Herbert in the long run, but he's saying how versatile and balanced this offense is going to be one game. You're going to throw the ball 30 times. One game, we may throw it 15 times. Doesn't matter at the end of the day, as long as that results in a win, that's all that matters to him. Some people asked him, it was like, what about 50 pass attempts a game? And he just sat back and smiled like 50 times, 70 times, 80 times, the more, the better. Obviously he would love to throw the ball, but he understands what the ultimate goal is. It does not matter as long as you're winning. Dan, I think the the last piece in terms of what Herbert talked about, the return of Shane Day mm-hmm. and having him come back as the quarterback's coach. Um, there was a big reason, and I, again, I go back to this Harbaugh aspect, to, to recognize, and I'm sure that Justin Herbert had input on this, but to say, what is it that you need that we can help you with to take you into this next year of development you know that Shane Day had to come up in conversation, especially when you witness what Shane did had just done being part of a staff that had assisted CJ Stroud in doing what they did in Houston. So you you bring back Shane Day, who had a very, very close relationship with Justin Herbert just a few years back during arguably the best season that Justin Herbert had. And he talked about he's an, he's an incredible coach. He's done such a great job for this quarterback room, the relationship that he has, not just with him, but the guys that are behind him in Easton Stick, Max Duggan. It's just that the quarterback room in general is great. So the development of Justin Herbert from that one standpoint in terms of Shane Day and a previous regime, Jim Harbaugh made the effort and, and wanted to do something for Justin Herbert and bring back his favorite quarterback's coach. Gotta love that. Yeah. Look, the the team, the staff talked about kind of the, the coats of paint being painted over the car over the past few months. And they've had coat after coat after coat. They're now on the fourth coat, which I believe will be training camp coming up. And it's all about kind of getting this thing primed and ready for that drive off the track or on the track, depending on how you're looking at it. And this is what you like to see. You want to see that crescendo, that peak at the right time and everything building towards being the healthiest and ready to rock at training camp and the regular season when it kicks off against the Raiders week one, which is wild. Uh, lots that we went through today. I know this is kind of a rapid fire fire hose, uh, drinking from a fire hose at times, but 
lots to digest, lots to dissect. Again, if you have not done so already, please hit that like and subscribe. Helps out a ton. Leave a review. All the things that you guys do, all the critiques, all the constructive criticism, all the love, all of it. We appreciate it all. Uh, Jake, anything else before we head out of here tonight? Everybody enjoy your break because we're not going to be hearing about football with this team for a little while. And that will be when they return to El Segundo in the new Bolt facility for the beginning of training camp. Dan, it seems like from the standpoint that we're right in the middle of June, that football's just around the corner. But then I'm reminded of what the days of the draft in April does to you. When you're yearning for it this bad, the days are going to feel like years. We're almost there. Yep. We're almost there. We're almost there. It's only June, but it will be September before you know it. And uh, we can't wait, but we will be over there with you every step of the way. And we're not going anywhere. We got lots of topics to have over the next six weeks before training camp starts. But until then, uh, for Jake, LAFB, Chargers Unleashed, uh, I'm Dan. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed.